Hi everyone, nice to meet you. I'm Justin. Um, I work at IntelliJ uh, at JetBrains on the IntelliJ Scala plugin. You can follow me on Twitter if you like. And this is Fork It Harder, Make It Better. So uh, you may recognize this picture. Who, who knows it? Yeah, that's right. It's uh, the Scala tooling ecosystem. <laughs> Some have called it a Scala type system or garden of earthly delights, but I don't think that's quite accurate. So the purpose of this talk is uh, to just give you a whirlwind overview of a variety of tools inside and outside the Scala ecosystem that have, a, have the potential to improve your development experience. I'll give you some examples where other languages do it better uh, and where this could lead in the world of Scala. I'll structure it as a kind of Hegelian dialectic with a thesis, synthesis, synth thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. And as you see, it's illustrated by Hieronymus Bosch with uh, lyrics by Daft Punk. Uh, fork it, make it. Do it makes us harder, better, faster, stronger. So uh, forking, I'm using the term a bit liberally here. I'll just say anything that revolves around creating new tools or creating new versions of old, new old tools is kind of forking. And so. Creating new stuff all the time may make your, the whole process harder to learn because new stuff has some overhead in learning. But it might enable better and faster ways of doing stuff and overall make the ecosystem stronger. So I'm going to assume some basic familiarity with the existing Scala toolset that you're commonly using, but that's not necessary to understand most of this talk. So let's zoom in a, in a bit on uh, what the thing, what kind of things tools help with. There's a whole variety. I'll go over a few of them within this talk, like learning, experimenting, editing code, exploring, understanding, building, dependency management publishing, versioning, and others. So first step when you're starting out with a language, or if you're just trying to understand the code you wrote last month, is learning about it, experimenting with it. You'd like that to be more interactive than uh, running a two-hour build and then seeing what comes out of it. So, so fast feedback loops will improve your productivity in general. The classic fast feedback loop is the read, eval, print loop, the REPL. Scala comes with one, SPT comes with one, IntelliJ comes with one. Uh, an approved version of the Scala REPL is Emonite. You might have seen it. It gives you all kinds of features like history search, syntax, highlighting, block input, undo, redo. Uh, and many others that I might not even know about. A different approach to the REPL is the um, worksheet. So in the REPL, you know, you enter stuff line by line, you mu mutate some hidden state. In the worksheet, uh, you have one document where you have all your code right in front of you. Uh, here I'm presenting SCASTY. You can find it on the Scala website. It has some nice features like uh, quick re-evaluation. Um, it's SPT based. So what I'm doing, I'm looking at the Gigahorse HTTP library, just copy pasting some code from the Gigahorse website and modifying it to actually just download the worksheet I'm working on right now. Um, let's see. This runs a bit because SPT and 
Oh, it's gone again. Yeah, but you saw it. Maybe saw it downloaded. The actual website, the page I was working on. We also have a worksheet in the IntelliJ Scala plugin. Um, a different approach, sort of between the REPL and the worksheet, is the notebook. So, like with a REPL, you have a persistent state you, that you edit bit by bit, but you have this concept of cells that stick around. You can edit and update the cells. Here's the Jupyter implementation for Scala. And I'm just playing around a bit, making a histogram of some words. A common feature in worksheets is to is a graphical output. So I'm going to plot here. Looks nice. So this makes it particularly popular among data scientists. But I think it could greatly enhance day-to-day uh, -day development experience if it were more easily integrated into your regular projects. In fact, we're also sort of working on that in the Scala plugin, turning the worksheet into a bit of a notebook. The notebook was actually pioneered by Mathematica, like 1988 or so. And Mathematica is still quite ahead of its time. It uses the worksheet format for all its documentation. So you can actually browse this documentation. I'm playing around here with a nest function. It has graphical output, very quick feedback. I found this Sierpinski triangle of x's, change them for a u. I got inspired to uh, import the picture of Václav Sierpinski and you know, scale it down a bit to, let's say, 20 pixels and put it in this yeah, Sierpinski triangle. <laughs> You're welcome. So in my opinion, this is kind of the gold standard for documentation. But uh, someone would have to invest the time. So you've played around a bit, but you still want to understand the code better uh, and actually change it, edit it. So editing is not just typing into Notepad. Otherwise, why would there be IntelliJ? Um, you often. So another nice feature of Mathematica. So this is a computer algebra system. So I'm entering some algebraic random formula with square root and sum. And Mathematica instantly prints it as a nice format. And what am I doing here? I'm just pressing a button, and it transforms the syntax between different representations. Uh, so in instead of code formatting, we could have, so like instead of code styles that we enforce on a project level, we could do this like instantly in the editor. And you see here, uh, Mathematica has different input forms, input form, full form, which is closer to the Lisp S expressions. And those can be easily rendered as a tree. I think this would be nice for uh, pattern matching, for instance. And Mathematica does have very powerful pattern matching, by the way. Um, so down from the ivory tower of mathematics to uh, bare metals. The interactive disassembler has a neat feature that takes disassembled pieces of machine code, assembly code, and splits them up into bits that reference each other. So you can see where the code actually flows. It's maybe not as relevant in a more structured language such as, such as Scala. But another approach I've seen, it went around a few years ago, the code bubbles IDE. So instead of messing around with files, file windows and scrolling up and down, you open a method, for instance, in a bubble. And if you want to know what's going on inside that bubble, you open a link with a bubble beside it, you group these bubbles. So you get to have a method usage site, and 
its definition right next to each other conveniently. So this allows you a more uh, semantic way of exploring code. As far as I can tell, this IDE is still being developed. It's Eclipse-based, uh, but I don't think it's very actively developed, and like you can't even import a Maven project. So, so again, the missing ingredient is integration. <laughs> but the basic idea is you might, might make files more or less obsolete as a method of exploring, organizing your code. Now, nonetheless, uh, you've written your code, but to actually get to a uh, working software, you need to compile it. So in that sense, a compiler is a tool. Um, now, more specifically to Scala, there is an actual fork of the main Scala compiler, which is type-level Scala, which aims to uh, integrate new features more quickly or, and sort of serve as a testing ground for features that are likely to make it into the main Scala distribution. A different approach would be the reasonable Scala compiler developed by your Eugene Bermako at Twitter. Um, I don't think this is actually him on the picture. Where the idea is to have more of an experimental re-implementation focused on performance, perhaps finding some kind of subset of Scala that is uh, compiled in a more reasonable time. Now, once we wrap the compiler, we could get a compile server. There is Bloop, developed by the Scala Center. It is based on Zinc, which also forms the basis of the SBT compilation. But it aims to keep this one compiler around on your system uh, in a uh, hot JVM so that you actually benefit of all the JIT optimization that the JVM will do for you. And it integrates with a variety of build tools such as SPT and Fury and Maven and I don't know what. Now getting from compiling to working software doesn't from code to working software doesn't just involve compiling, but also actually assembling things together, like all the other piece of, pieces of code you wrote or scavenged off the internet. We call this dependency management. Um, so build tools, my, my favorite topic since I mostly work on build tool integration in IntelliJ. Nobody seems to be entirely happy with their build tools, as evidenced by the fact that there is one ending in ache for approximately every letter of the alphabet. And yeah, these are just the ones ending in ache, and not all of them. And as far as I know, none of these are Scala focused, but we have our own aches, headaches. So in the right corner, we have the, the Java classics such as Ant, Maven, Gradle. Does anyone actually build Scala with Ant? <laughs> Until like last year, we still had some Ant in our IntelliJ Scala build. Um, in the left corner, the Scala-focused tools such as SPT, the, the main one, and the challengers, MIL, and CVT. And in the middle corner, the more monorepo-focused fo tools such as Bazel, Pants, and Buck, which are used by large organizations, typically. And uh, yeah, what's this? Look like John Pretty snuck in his fury. <laughs> OK. Um, so quick look at Basil, or Basil, or I don't know what. It, it's an anagram of Blaze, so I like it. Um, 
uh, it, it aims to give you reproducible and fast builds and correct builds. And so to make it fast, you might need caching, but caching is usually not really very correct unless you're very careful. Uh, Bazel addresses this by making all the inputs of an individual task build step uh, fully defined. And the other tools like Buck and Pants do it similarly. Now, SPT used to have uh, fully Scala built description language. They moved away from that eventually, and some people didn't like it. So CBT and Mill were created to, again, define builds fully in Scala. Uh, they're kind of similar, but they differ in some aspects, such as CBT doesn't define how what what tasks or build steps are cached but it just offers you some utilities to do so if you want and mill by default has task cache uh, cached tasks and uncached tasks uncached commands and allows you to inspect the task graph whereas in cbt the task graph is uh, simply the method called graph both yeah, try to reduce the complexity of defining your builds and use a nail gun for background processes so you don't have the whole startup time involved with starting an SPT shell. OK, I want to create and publish a library. So in, in Scala or JVM, in general, this is, well, maybe not a monumental, but a really annoying task that I never really got around to. And uh, let's have a look at how other languages do it. So for instance, in Rust, Rust has the cargo build tool and the crates IO website with all the packages that are published. I want to create a simple package. So what I'm going to do is I'll just create a API token, take that and you know, basically just copy it into my, my REPL and Cargo offers a tool to make a new library. I'll open it up, not in IntelliJ, and you see a simple package definition. Okay, cool. I'll just add this stuff to Git. and try to publish. That didn't quite work out. It wants me to actually manually put in the description and license. So fine, I'll do that. The WTFPL I think is appropriate here. Let's just try again. OK, then. That seems to be working, right? Let's check out crates. And yes, it's the newest published library. Uh, so, so this was like two minutes of real time. I don't think in that time you can even create a ticket on Sonatype. Um, in Elm, the publishing process is slightly more involved, but quite similar, not too hard. Um, but what I really like about it is the versioning. So I published already before. I have this simple library with one function, harder. I want to expand it by better and add just some stupid function. And it offers you a tool to diff the API. So it tells you if this change you made is a patch, a minor, or a major by semantic versioning. And 
to be a good library author, I put in proper documentation here. Actually, Elm requires this of you before you pack package it. OK, this was a minor change because I added a function. It asks you a few questions. And it will bump the version automatically for you. So I'll try committing this and publishing. That didn't quite work out. I need to tag the git commit with the version number. Fine. It'll give me the instructions. I don't have to think. And let's check it. And there's a new version out. Sorry for publishing libraries that have no use besides demonstration. OK, I want to make a breaking change. This function was stupid. I remove it again. I do a diff, and it tells me, yes, this is a major change. And do the same steps again to republish. And I think this is a really nice way of managing versions, at least giving you a hand in telling you there are breaking changes here and giving you some sorts of guarantees that what you publish is compatible or not compatible. In Scala, it might be not quite as simple because we have all these side effects. Uh, in, in Elm, it's basically purely functional. So yeah, I mentioned scavenging code off the internet. Uh, in, in SBT, this has been a major pain point if you consider the build times, many times, if you can't complain about build times, it might not be the compiler. It might be an IV resolving dependencies over and over again. Uh, a major improvement on this is Coursier, and it's currently actually being integrated into SBT, finally. Another view on this thing, uh, package manager uh, is Nix. It follows maybe some similar ideas, such as Bazel, in that for every package that you create, you have to fully define inputs, and you get to cache the outputs and reuse them. And that thus your packages will be fully reproducible, fully specified. And it's actually possible to create Nix packages from SPT builds with an SPT plugin called SPTX. SPTX. Back to Java. So yeah, I, I mentioned publishing, creating sonotype tickets is a nuisance. If you're a bit lazy, you could use Jitpack. It sort of gives you source dependencies in Java, because I think source dependencies have the potential to solve many of the problems that you have with publishing. So Jitpack will just take your build off GitHub and publish stuff and, and create binaries for you that you can depend on just by adding the resolver. I don't exactly know where where the limits of this are, but it, I mean, it seems to work. People just seem a li little aversive to using it. Fine. Now, the antithesis. As I mentioned, creating more and more tools uh, increases the learning overhead. You might not be able to keep up. So why don't we improve the existing tools just integrate better ideas into them. More than ever, hour after, our work is never over. And indeed, the Scala tooling maintainers, their work is never over. Our work is never over. The Scala compiler has been continually developed, currently is being maintained by Lightbend. And 2.13 is right around the corner with the goal of simplifying collections, improving compiler performance, and just you know general more user-friendliness in the API, especially with the collections. 
SBT as a tool has been around for a long time as well. It was created 2009, is now also maintained primarily by Lightbend, and is still being used for a majority of Scala builds. There's a huge plugin ecosystem, so if you need a specific thing done, it's relatively easy to find a plugin or write one. And it too has making contribution easier, making the usage easier on its roadmap. And of course, the IntelliJ Scala plugin, the talk wouldn't be complete without me mentioning it, has been around since 2006 even. The first commit was sometime then. There's currently nine or almost 10 people on the team. Soon it will be 10. And we're also working hard to improve the overall experience. Uh, in the current release, we don't have many big flashy features. We've been working on the underpinnings, including performance, fixing longstanding issues with error highlighting, and so on. But we did recently introduce some nice things like the what I call the implicit radar. Uh, another complaint has been for newbies, it's hard to really get started with Scala and IntelliJ. So my colleague Pavel just measured how hard it is. It was like over 100 clicks. And to remedy that, he created this one-click bundle that you just download, start up, and you can have your Hello World right in front of you. So no more excuses not to use IntelliJ, right? Actually, who, met, who, who uses IntelliJ primarily for Scala? Yeah. Well, thanks, valued customers. <laughs> who pays for IntelliJ? <laughs> Thank you, valued customers. I will not disappoint you. Um, <laughs> but if I am disappointing you, you can talk to me and we'll, we'll hash that out in front of the doors. Um, so yeah, this implicit radar. No, actually, I tried to get critiques um, on ideas how to improve the Scala plugin. Um, this implicit radar, so, so far we've had uh, tooltips for implicits, like you see here, and special actions to compute which implicit is being used. Uh, recently, we improved on that. We just press a button, and you get a view what implicit parameters are being passed with what values, or what implicit conversions are happening, as you see here. Yes? Uh, control Alt Shift Plus. <laughs> <laughs> there are many. We had to find some some button, <laughs> and and actually there's two levels of detail that you can add. So you can press Control Alt Shift Plus twice to get more, and Control Alt Shift minus to take it back out again. This is in two eighteen two. In case you haven't upgraded yet. Please go ahead. Yeah. OK. So does the key, um, there might be special key mappings for French keyboard or otherwise manually reassign? It's, it, OK. Yeah, good, good, good comment. Uh, it's really hard to find good keys that aren't yet used in IntelliJ. We might have to go to Emacs style keys. <laughs> I think there are even some features that use that Emacs style already. OK. So we've dis discussed what kind of new stuff could bring us improvements and how to how we're improving the current tools. But to get the new stuff actually to improve our life, we need a kind of convergence, a synthesis. 
and it goes like this fork it harder make it better do it faster makes us stronger more than ever hour after our work is never over so many new tools suffer from a lack of integration because it's too hard to get them to work with the old tools but agreeing on tools and styles and workflows as a community can make us more cohesive and productive, stronger. So this year, as the tooling developers have started to work together more closely, so in t I've worked with the SBT developers and the Scala Center to bring our tools closer together. Oops. Uh, recently, the LSP language server protocol and Scala tooling protocol working groups have been initiated. We came together at various Scala conferences to discuss the way forward. There, in Scala Days Berlin, there was a whole tooling summit where we discussed this and worked together. So LSP, the language server protocol, who's heard of this? Yeah, many, but not all. So it's a protocol developed by Microsoft uh, to integrate language servers, so like compilers and so on, tools that know about how to work with a language into the VS Code editor. Unfortunately, IntelliJ doesn't directly profit off this because we have our whole own system of integrating languages. But for everyone else, uh, there's this effort called Metals to create a language server in based on Scala Meta. And looks promising so far. And likewise, uh, for Dottie or Scala 3 now, the IDE story so far is based on the language server protocol as well. Now, what I've been working on is the build server protocol, because as you saw in Scala, we have this whole plethora of build tools and then all the aches. And I'd like to be able to integrate with all these build tools without supporting each tool individually, because that's just, to be honest, way too much work. I would be repeating similar but not the same bugs for each tool, because I don't need to write new communication protocols or ways of communicating with them each time. So together with the Scala Center, we've been working on the build server protocol to formalize these interactions. It's basically an extension of LSP. It's currently supported by Bloop, the compile server. And it's already in the IntelliJ Scala nightlies. We're currently revamping the protocol a bit to, uh, to work with new use cases that came up. But it's very extensible nonetheless. So maybe Fury will quickly be usable in IntelliJ or MIL. Nonetheless, in IntelliJ, it's an integra integrated development environment. We work on integrations all the time. So as you know, we have SBT, Hokan, uh, recently Scala format has been integrated. MNI scripting support is relatively new. And in the ultimate version, you get some extras for Play, Scala.js, Akka, and Spark coming soon. The Spark support, like, well, the, these features are ultimate only Spark support probably as well. Because we got to earn money somehow, you know. <laughs> But all the basics are there in the community version. And of course, there's third-party plugins for many tools like Bazel or CBT. 
Now, how how do you come in here? You might not be able to be paid for working on tooling full time, even though you probably have some pain points. But considering how much time do you spend working around tooling, maybe it would be beneficial to invest some time in the tooling itself for you and everybody. So in that regard, maybe get in touch with me or other tooling developers. We still have the Scala spree going on, maybe, in the room over there. And talk to your your bosses or bosses, bosses, I don't know, that you need time to work on the tooling. <laughs> Unless you're perfectly happy with tooling, in that case, ignore this talk. Okay, so this is the Q&A pool. Uh, bear yourself, jump in, give me comments, ask questions. I'm here for you. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Uh, for the Spark, uh, for the Spark integration with uh, with Entergy, it will be like a standalone, uh, like a standalone version of St Spark, who is uh, a standalone container Spark uh, with Entergy. I can't give you details on that at the moment. Okay. Just saying, we're working on it. <laughs> when it's done enough. <laughs> Any more comments? Well then, thank you.